So good evening from Wolfell and Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people, and welcome to summer. As June is National Indigenous History Month, I encourage us all to think about our role in understanding the truth and how we can each contribute to reconciliation. I would also like to remind us all that while a lot of what we hear and know is history, the impacts of this history and actions continue today, and that we will still have a lot of injustice in our country. Reconciliation is needed. We need to move from talk to action, and in doing so, let the seven sacred teachings guide us. Respect, courage, wisdom, humility, truth, honesty, and love. I think that our topic this evening is a nice complement to the Indigenous way of life and that we could do to learn a lot more about Mi'kma'ki and how we take care of it. My name is Una Proudfoot and I'm the Executive Director of Alumni Affairs in the Office of Advancement at Acadia. It's a pleasure to have a panel of three guests here with us this evening to chat about sustainable tourism. Just a couple of points before we get started and I introduce our speakers though. So as you enter, we ask that you mute your microphones uh, to avoid background noise. Uh, secondly, we ask that you disable your video uh, and that's uh, right next to the microphone. So you just click on the little icon that looks like a film, uh, old style film camera and that will disable your video. We welcome questions at any point in time in the conversation and you can do that a number of ways. You can launch your chat function and type your question into the chat function. I will keep an eye on it, and if I see questions, I will go to our panelists. Uh, you can also raise your virtual hand if you're more comfortable um, uh, asking your, your question out loud, and you can turn on your video and raise your actual hand. So you can get our attention a number of different ways if you wish to engage our, one or all of our panelists with a question. We encourage engagement and involvement and certainly uh, contribution to the conversation. And finally, we've entered all of your names into a draw and we'll announce the winner of the Acadia Alumni Swag Package at the end of the program. So joining us this evening, we have three guests who are um, have quite lengthy resumes. Uh, I have an excerpt from each uh, and we'll get into the topic of sustainable uh, tourism. So Janet, excuse me, Shannon Gehan, Grad, graduate of 2002, a tourism development specialist, Shannon has more than 15 years of international experience working at multiple levels of tourism development and delivery. She has worked in travel delivery, delivery as a consultant. In her role as Chief Sustainability Officer and Head of Tread Right for the Travel Corporation, TTC, a family of 40 travel brands operating worldwide. Shannon leads the development and implementation of the group's five-year sustainability strategy and climate action plan. She also oversees the Tread Right Foundation, TTC's not-for-profit dedicated to supporting projects under the foundation's three pillars of planet, people, and wildlife globally. Shannon presents regularly at and participates in key industry forums and special committees. In 2018, she was recognized by Canadian Traveler magazine as a top 40 under 40 in the Canadian travel industry, and in 2021 as a top performer by the World Travel and Tourism Commission. She has guest lectured at Harvard University and is regularly called on by media to share insights into the development of a sustainable tourism industry. In addition to her outdoor recreation and environmental education from Acadia University, Shannon holds a master's in science in tourism and environmental management, where she focused on integrating the principles of sustainability into marine-based ecotourism. Her first and best job was as a sea kayaking guide in her home province of Newfoundland and Labrador. Welcome, Shannon. Dr. John Colton is a professor in Acadia's Department of Community Development and also teaches in the Environmental and Sustainability Studies Program. Dr. Colton's research interests include Indigenous tourism, sustainable tourism, community sustainability, stakeholder engagement processes, and issues related to social license and acceptance of renewable energy projects. He is the co-author of the Community and Business Tidal Energy Toolkit and the Handbook of Community Engagement for Tidal Energy. In 2009, he served on the Nova Scotia Renewable Energy Steering Committee that developed the Renewable Energy Strategy and Renewable Energy Targets for Nova Scotia. He is a past co-chair of the Atlantic Aboriginal Health Research Program, chair of the Centre for Rural Sustainability, and founding member of the Acadia Tidal Energy Institute. He is an adjunct professor for the University of the West Fjords in I Iceland. He was the East Coast Sustainable Tourism Expert for National Geographic's World Legacy Program and has served on an, as an expedition leader for several Northern Canadian river-based expeditions for National Geographic. 
He continues to lead Northern River expeditions in Alaska, British Columbia, and the Yukon, and the Northwest Territories yearly for Canadian River expeditions and the Hani River expeditions. Thank you for joining us, John. And last but certainly not least is Dave Green, grad of 2008 and 2016. Dave has a degree in community development at Akiti as well as a master's in education. Dave founded a not-for-profit speaker series called Night of Adventure in 2013 as a platform for people to be able to share their stories of grand adventure through video, photography, and storytelling. He has been exploring the human spirit to adventure over the last decade traveling eight different routes of 30 days or more across Canada via bicycling, snowshoe, and ski, but mainly canoe. He has been honored to carry a flag for the Royal Canadian Geographic Society, Canadian Geographic, on Expedition Twice. In his free time, Dave works as an elementary school learning center teacher and resides along Nova Scotia's eastern shore. So again, thank you all three of you for joining us this evening. I joke with Dave, we, we go back a little ways, and I joke with Dave that I would fill in some more uh, in, his, uh, in his bio. We'll add some in as the, as the conversation goes on. So I'm enough for me. I've been chatting since we started this thing. Uh, I'd like to toss it out each, to each of the panelists. Um, and, and uh, I'll let you know what order we'll do it in and ask each of you to just give us a little bit more about who you are. So you submitted those bios for us so that I could introduce you. Uh, but this is your this is your stage. This is your platform now for the next few minutes. So tell us a little bit about how you got to where you are, uh, a little bit about your, your particular passions in life and perhaps a little bit about what your mission in life is currently and sort of what you think about when you w open your eyes in the morning. So uh, Shannon, I'm going to start with you on that one and uh, toss it over to you to, to share a little bit of whatever you're willing to share with us. I feel like, <clears throat> excuse my voice, I feel like I need to start with apologizing for sending you such a long bio to read through, Una. I've never <laughs> read read out. That's never, that's never comfortable. Um, hi, everybody. Great to be here. John, I'm going to be in, a, in the West Fjords in August. So... I feel like that's a whole other conversation for, for another time, but that's awesome. So, yeah, I mean, what brought me to tourism? As you said, Una, growing up in, in Newfoundland um, at around the time when the cod stocks collapsed and everybody was leaving for greener pastures, um, <clears throat> that's when tourism was really happening to the province. And I started as a sea kayak guide when I was 16, maybe too young to be guiding, but that's a, a, also another problem for another day. Um, but it was really interesting to me because it was sort of this mad dash towards, well, we can't fish. Everyone's leaving. Tourism was starting to happen. Here's another way and a soft industry, which has always really made me chuckle a little bit because whilst we're not extractive by nature, we're certainly not soft either. If you look at sort of everything from um, you know, recent films that have come out to you know the impact of mass tourism. And so after guiding for a couple of years, um, I decided that I wanted to learn a little more. And I did a master's in tourism and environmental management and uh, really focused at the time actually on code of conduct, voluntary codes of conduct for marine based tourism, because, of course, from the seat of my kayak, I saw a lot of really bad behavior and I saw um, a lot of decisions being made without the community's involvement. And I think that that's often um, misunderstood. So yes, tourism is the world's biggest employer, driver of conservation, what we all love to do when we can do it. Um, it also can be very impactful on a community, fabric of a community. Look at Airbnb, for example, what it's done to Paris and Barcelona. So uh, I really wanted tourism to be different. And um, I guess I was bold enough to think that I could help in some way, shape or form. And I really wanted tourism to be less about sort of extracting that experience and more about a way in which it couldn't work with a community to build a community's resources. At the end of the day, as, as lame as this sounds, you know, if it's a good place to visit, it has to be a good place to live. And I mean, that's pretty basic for what sustainable tourism is for me. Um, and so I shifted from owning a consulting agency a couple of years back who really focused on small niche operators to moving into what would be considered the mass space. And it, I was I kind of felt like I was kicking and screaming against my own decisions there. But I did that because the opportunity to work at scale 
means the opportunity for impact. And, um, you know, I think that I think that we all travel, we all take vacations, whether it's for business or to see family or to go on that vacation that COVID's kept us away from. And I really want people to recognize that if they have any sensibilities for buying local, composting, reducing their footprint at home, they really have to take those sensibilities on the road to where they travel because you're a guest. Um, and that's that's what I'm going for. Thank you for that, Shannon. I've taken some uh, some <clears throat> notes and uh, we'll come back around with some, right. some questions um, once we uh, hear a little bit from each of the other guests. Uh, so, so Dave, I'm going to toss it over to you next um, to tell us a little bit more about about you and, and what you're doing. Oh, hey, everybody. My name's Dave Green. Um, Una, thank you for the wonderful introduction. And Shannon, nice to meet you. John, great to see you again, too. This is a great opportunity. Um, uh, my story is much more convoluted and strange uh, than, than Shannon's, I think. Uh, no, no, that was a beautiful story. Thank you for sharing it. Uh, Sometimes I was thinking to myself over the last couple of weeks, I'm like, man, why did they invite me onto this? I'm, I'm, I don't work in the tourism industry at all. I'm, I'm an elementary school teacher. Um, and, and while I'm sitting here listening to these introductions, I'm thinking to myself, oh, okay, well, well, I suppose when I was doing my master's of education at Acadia, uh, John here uh, actually supervised to some degree a, um, a master's levels uh, independent project that I did uh, for one of my great... Uh, Hobbies. It's turned into more of a hobby, more, more than just a hobby. But uh, these long-distance human-powered trips that uh, that I've taken on now, I've done well at least eight of them that are thirty days or longer and over a thousand kilometers long. But I've done spent I, I would guess probably three years of my life in a tent by this point. Uh, so I've spent quite a bit of time trekking around as the tourist, and, and sometimes it's not. Not, not really the tourist that goes into towns and spends any money. I'm kind of the tourist that tries to get as far away from the towns as possible. Um, but but from that perspective, I think I have a good idea on what people are looking for and what uh, avenues could be explored in the sustainable tourism field. Um, but getting back to my point there with John, he supervised a project of mine where I, I did a, uh, was the first uh, Royal Canadian Geographic flag that I carried was for a 400 kilometer snowshoe trip in Northern Quebec. And as part of my master's of education, I developed curriculum that I put into place into schools to engage students into the trip that would engage them interactively with us while we were moving along this specific route, but also with the communities and the schools and the kids who lived up there as well. Um, so through that, I've been able to integrate my, my profession as a teacher with my hobby and passion as an adventurer and explorer. To be able to integrate both together uh, has been really rewarding for me over the years uh, to be able to bring these real life expeditions in real time into the classroom so that not only can students see different parts of the world, uh, but they can also learn about their growth mindset and what they're actually capable of doing and building the, the resiliency and patience and these other tools that we have to uh, you know, regulate ourselves, but they're, we, we think of them as tools, but they're really actually muscles that we need to train in our brains. Um, and through, by doing difficult things, the only way to get better at dealing with stressful situations is by putting yourself in stressful situations. It's the same with problem solving. It's the same with, you know, building resiliency and all these things. So to be able to integrate both of these worlds and these, these lives of mine into one has been, uh, it's been really great. And I'm very thankful for the education that I got at Acadia for that. Thank you, everybody. And, and through all this, from writing all these grants, and, and we have some academics here tonight, I'm sure, writing grants is no fun, right? Nobody wants to write grants. It's no fun. And you're not even guaranteed to get them. You just write them, and it sucks. Um, so through that and through the idea of storytelling and building community, um, I developed a speaker series here in Nova Scotia called Night of Adventure. And the whole idea, the principle is to build community through storytelling. Uh, it's, it's plain and simple. And, and through that, I've managed to raise and give away um, about $8,500 in the last three years to grassroots expeditions specifically so that they don't have the finances uh, as a barrier preventing them from going forth and following their dreams. Um, 
and and I've, we've made it the e we call it the easiest grant you'll ever apply for. It's 250 words or less. Just prove to us that you're going to go do it no matter what. And uh, we'll follow through on our end if you follow through on yours. Uh, and you can find more about this at nightofadventure.com. Uh, uh, they're on the, all the sources out there. We've been Instagram, Facebook, all the thing. We're just trying to spread the good word. And essentially, if I had to pitch it to you, it would be, well, it's a plat it, we're exploring the human spirit through storytelling. Um, but... Um, it's like a TED Talks meets everybody loves TED Talks, right? Yeah. And everybody loves the Banff Mountain Film Festival. Yeah. Yeah. Take those two things, put them together, and you get Night of Adventure. <laughs> Thanks for that, Dave. Uh, and thank you for telling us a little bit more about what it is that you do. And I, again, have some questions that we're going to come back around and, and ask for some input from your different perspectives on on uh, exactly what we're talking about this evening. But before we do that, over to you, John, to uh, to give us a few minutes of, of perspective and input and tell us how you got where you are and, and what makes you tick. Well, you know, I, I first of all, I'm sort of chuckling a little bit at, at what Dave had to share because, um, you know, Dave and I have known each other for a long time. And I and what I'm you know, which, you know, we're the conversation has lots of themes and overlaps because I think Shen and I are Shen and I are, you know, more involved in what you might label as a tourism industry, you know, kind of different ways and different levels and but both with guiding experience and and you know, and Dave is, you know, I guess what I sometimes see is a classic adventure. I teach a leadership course and they read um the 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 um the endurance, you know, the Shackleton uh, you know, story trapped in the ice and how they survived and how he brought everyone back. And it, and I use that to help to teach, you know, leaderships and resiliency and problem solving and things like that. And and, um, you know, and the people that I spend time with up north that I, you know, who pay great, you know, sums of money often to travel and, and go into these wilderness areas, um, aspire to do a lot of things that Dave does as an adventurer, but I'm able to kind of do it in a, um, give them a sense of adventure, you know, and uh, without, uh, you know, without sort of taking on sort of the risk logistics. And it's it's just totally different mindsets. Um, but I, you know, I really, there's a real distinction between between what Dave does, you know, I'll, you know, putting 30 days, you know, major expeditions and and I guess I might say carefully crafted commercial, you know, tourism based expeditions. But but going back to your your question, you know, I I, I quite honestly stumbled into tourism. Uh, I was in the Navy for five years in in the uh, station in San Diego, got out and didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, and uh, I had a friend who was guiding for a rafting company up north and I started going to university in, in Southern California and, and I, um, I sent my resume and I remember sending a picture of myself standing on top of a mountain beaten BC and the only reason they hired me because I was fool enough to send a picture and say apparently that I was strong as an ox you know in this you know when I was you know a 23 year old to some Canadian river expeditions but it was enough to get their attention only because they wanted to see who was guy who actually would send a photo of himself standing on top of a mountain and kind of being ridiculous in their cover letter. But, but that was in about 1988. And, you know, it's interesting. So I did that, you know, I, I did that every summer. Um, you know, I put myself through undergraduate, my master's and PhD, you know, guiding, you know, from May until September. And, and I'm pretty excited that on Saturday I'm leaving to go up and guide another trip so I'm you know I've been doing it for over 30 years on the first river day um and uh you know but when I was guiding you know my fourth year I had a professor who showed up on one of my trips and I was just about done with my undergrad and he said this might be a cool master's and I was like what's that right and he was from Alberta and so I ended up being my master's advisor where I actually looked at the experience that people have when they have extended you know time in the wilderness and and what that does to them personally and how does it impact their relationships, their confidence, sort of the stuff that Dave was talking about, resiliency. And then um, I had another professor who showed up on the trip three years later. And he said, you know, this would make a really cool Ph.D. I wasn't even thinking about doing a Ph.D. And uh, but we were working with an indigenous community at the time, trying to develop leadership and in, in around uh, using tourism as a venue. And so then I ended up working in northern Alberta with five First Nation communities facilitating Sort of using tourism as a tool for economic development, but as, as a strategy for self-determination and 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 re, you know reaffirming uh, relationships among people and and the landscape. And um, 
And, uh, and that's been a bit of a theme. I, I think what drives me, and I'll just wrap up with this, is that you know, sustainable tourism can be a lot of things, and I think we've all touched on it in small degrees, but you know, I, you know, Shannon made a really good point that if people are, you know, are coming there, it must be a good place to live as well. And I guess I concentrate on that, what makes it a good place to live, and if we're going to share it with others, what can we, what can we do to take care of it so it's always going to be good for those, those who live there, you know, in terms of economics, wellness, health, empowerment? You know, how can you think of tourism and the industry and you know, the pieces that support that, you know, how can they do multiple things besides help build an economy? Yeah, I'll leave it at that for now. Thanks, John. Uh, so many, uh, so many points again with your introduction as well. Um, and, and Dave, I, I forgot to say that after you did your introduction, I, it, what you've got is the envy of so many that you have a, a job that you're um, complementing with what it is you enjoy doing as well. And, and John, when you mentioned the year 1988, gosh, it seems like so long ago, probably to you and I and folks on the line, probably many weren't even born then, but that was the year that I spent in Banff, Alberta, um, doing, a, doing a course through the Army Cadet League of Canada, um, which I would say also is sort of falling under that whole idea of sustainable tourism, um, you know, looking very different back in 1988 than it does now. So having said that, my first question to each of you, and, and I'm going to kind of go reverse order with this one, and, and I think I'm purposely starting with the professor amongst us, um, and you all did touch on it a little bit, but what would you offer up as each of your own definitions of sustainable tourism? And I'd like to start there for a number of different reasons. Um, first and foremost being that, um, you know, we, we chatted about this briefly last week when we, when we met for a few minutes, that we often throw words around that we assume folks mean and we assume folks understand and sort of we're all on that same starting point when we use words. Um, so I'd like to sort of bring, bring everyone up to speed on, on kind of what we mean when we say sustainable tourism. Having said that, I suspect that each of you will have slightly different versions of it or slightly different perspectives. So I'm um, asking you each to share with us what your starting point is when you when you uh, reference those two words together, sustainable tourism. So we'll start with John and then go to Dave and finish off with Shannon. Yeah, thanks, Una. I'm, I'm not, I mean, there's like a classic definition that just borrows on like that our common future, you know, development that meets the needs of the present without compromising each of future generations and the sustainable tourism is they have this really vague definition that's you know and there's all sorts of nuances around that and I um I you know I you know when I think about sustainable tourism when I work with communities which I you know which I do you know a fair amount of times um you know I I I do talk about four specific areas it's kind of my my take on the range of ways of looking at it, I, I talk about, um, you know, most most often I work with the community, honestly, the focus is, is they, they're looking at economic development and they see tourism as an opportunity to provide jobs, diversify the economy, employ youth. Um, Shannon was talking about um, uh, Newfoundland and Labrador. When I first arrived here, I had, I, I went out to Battle Harbor, um, just off the coast of Labrador because they had been nominated for uh, the World Legacy Award, Sustainable Tourism Award. And, and what I learned, like just as an example, th in that, that experience that, um, that, you know, it wasn't just about, you know, taking and revitalizing this community. And, and most people that could get out to Battle Harbor now would sort of be in sort of high-end small cruise ships and, and things like that. But, but um, so, you know, it's about, a tiny bit of part of, about the economy, but it's also, you know, when I go back to this idea of empowerment, I was, you know, one of the, the guides who was uh, sharing his story would, had been, he'd grown up fishing. And one of the first things he said is he'd rather be fishing, but if he can't do that, he'd like to be able to tell a story and be proud of his, his, his history. And, you know, and he has, he can go back, you know, four or five ge generations. And so I, I, I guess when I, when I work with communities, I, you know, I, I look at the role of economics, but I say, we know you want to do that. But what else can we intentionally think about? Like, how can we reaffirm or reconnect youth to uh, you know to each other? If I'm working with uh, indigenous communities, how do we reaffirm relationships with land, you know, and or pride or or any community? How do we use tourism as a vehicle for supporting wellness? So that can lead its way back into well, if we're gonna maybe we develop a trail, and um, and so like in Lenox Island, for example, in PEI when they were developing tourism. It was focused on economic development, but then they built the 10-kilometer trail, and then they built a cultural center. 
Um, and then they built um, the Minigu Cafe, which was an indigenous foods cafe. And then they started focusing on on the business elements. But they put all these little pieces in place. So um, anyways, I, you know, that's, you know, I, I think of it quite broadly. And um, I mean, I'll pass it on to uh, Shannon and Dave to, to share their insight. Over to you, Dave. And thank John. you for that, John. Yeah, thanks, John. Great segue. I, I actually, believe it or not, been to Battle Harbor as well, but I got there very differently than John did. I was I was on the tail end of a 3,000 kilometer uh, rowboat, bicycle, canoe trip, and uh, we throw in the towel somewhere a couple hundred kilometers west of there, um, right on the Labrador Plateau. Anyways, we were hit. We I found there by hitchhiking, and uh, the the local who picked me up. Uh, uh, was going to visit family in a place called Mary's Harbor, Lodge Bay. I can't remember right now. Very close to it, though. And uh, he was putting his boat in the water at the time. He was trailering his boat from Goose Valley to that part of Labrador. And uh, most of you won't know this, but Battle Harbor is very close to a place called Cape St. Charles. And Cape St. Charles is the most eastern point in mainland North America. Mainland North America. So excluding Newfoundland Island. Uh, and that's where Cape St. Charles is. So this guy was like, hey, you want to go see Cape St. Charles? I was really like, heck yeah, we do. Uh, so he took us there and he dropped us off. He says now, and he told us this story about where we were. Uh, and then he's like, you want to go see something else cool? We're like, yeah, we do. And uh, he drove us over to Battle Harbor in a little place called Indian Harbor, uh, took us to his little family cottage there. And we got, it was amazing because we had just spent three months uh, working our way to Labrador, specifically to see Labrador. And and we had spent so much time seeing uh, black flies and stouts and black spruce and no actual culture or history or people of the place that we had been felt so driven to go see that when we finally did throw in the towel and decided to hitchhike, we just happened to meet the guy who drove us to the place and showed us all of the things, right? So uh, coming, at, coming at Battle Harbor, such places from, from that angle, I find it really interesting that um, I, I suppose like the sustainable tourism aspects of it um, and, and creating an industry that can sustain itself but doesn't also ruin itself. I see a lot, especially in more developed places like Battle Harbor is pretty out there. So I don't think flocks of people are going to be going to Battle Harbor anytime soon. They should because it's phenomenal. Go, but it's out there. Uh, but I see this all the time with, uh, you know, creatives and marketing folk on social networks and geotagging has become a big problem um, with people putting location tags on specific places and then too many people showing up to them. So the places that were cool, you can, so you can't be self-proclaimed cool. So if you have a secret camping spot like, I don't know, Pollitt's Cove, now that it's cool, I can say it. But 10 years ago, I'd never been able to say it, right? Um, there's other places in Nova Scotia all over the country that the locals know about that are their secret spots and they're worried about letting the world know. So I guess from my aspect of, of exploration or seeing the world from my eyes for the first time um, is, is would be encouraging sustainable tourism, but at the same time protecting the really special places that are out there from the tourists themselves. And if you have the magic pixie dust on how to do that, Dave, care to share it? <laughs> I mean, I think I think that's the challenge, right? Is is finding that balance and 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 being able to. I, I loved how you said it's sustained but not ruined. Um, so so great words on that one. And and your your example of the story you told, um, you know, is is one of the things that I enjoy doing when I travel. Uh, is that self directed piece, right? Like just sort of actually avoiding the places that are the, that are the tourist hotspots and just ending up in a conversation with somebody who says, hey, do you want to go check out, um, um, you know, Cape St. Charles? You did see the two Newfoundlanders in the conversation kind of perk up when you said the most easterly point, right? Because we're both sitting here going, nah, it's Cape Spear, Cape Spear, Newfoundland. But I, I appreciate that you clarified the mainland point. So we're good. Uh, <clears throat> over to you, Shannon. I also tried to stay very clear on the difference between Newfoundland and Labrador, because if there's anybody on here from Labrador, they would also want that distinction. 100%. Also, Una, have you ever been to Battle Harbor? Because I have not. I have not. Have no. you been to Cape Spear? Cape Spear? Yes. 
nearly lost my kids off it. Maybe I should have let them blow away last summer, but no, yes, what? I have been. To <laughs> um, Dave, you just reminded me of a funny, but also not funny. I used to be a bike guide in Iceland and there was a summer where I, I turned up with all my buddies and we were getting the van ready and they were pissed off. They were, excuse me, they were very upset. They were just angry because some local guide had produced a book of all the secret spots, all the hot spots and and little geothermal pools in the middle of the back country that only your lo only your guide knew about. He put it in a book and he put it out there and all the Instagrammers got hold to it. So I'll tell you how to if we get, if we stop influencers, we'll have we'll have part of the way there with keeping those places secret. But anyways, sorry. Um definition of sustainable tourism. So um, you know what I, f I find in my space, in our space, there's always a new definition of sustainable tourism. There's like 200 and 350 sustainable tourism certifications and et cetera, et cetera. Um, my preference is not to distinguish sustainable tourism from tourism. Tourism just should all be sustainable full stop. And it's the way in which it's managed. So rather than telling you what I think it is, I think I'm going to try by example what it's not. Um, you know, so it is not foreign owned. So, you know, it actually is much, much greater value staying in a locally owned hotel that hires locals. Um, it is not that which damages through um, crowds, through poor behavior, through an inability to manage local uh, natural resources with, you know, the tourism experience, which Iceland's a really great example. When I first went there 12 years ago, all the marketers were selling you, you know, complete solitude on the surface of the moon and no one else around to interfere with your experience. And that was true 12, 13 years ago. Now it's true if you look this way, but there's a couple coaches behind you. So don't turn around. Um, you know, so it's it's sustainable tourism is tourism where the marketers and the destination developers and the community, they talk together and they all have a shared vision because um, marketers will just go for it. Um, you know, sustainable tourism is is is. Is not needing to sort of tick off a list of I, I want to go to Europe and I want to do the Vatican. I want to do I want to spin through all these places on a five day trip so I can click them all. You know, t what am I looking for? Tick them all off my my list of things to do. I'm fortunate enough to be able to have a pretty flexible. I got a boss in L.A. and a boss in Sydney. They don't care where I am. So I'm going to work for the month of October in Spain because I'm able to, because my job allows it, but also because I know October in Spain is quiet and I'm going to spend the whole month there with my kids because we're able to do that and, you know, stay a little bit longer. It's not zooming in, zooming out of all these places. Um, none of that is, is sustainable tourism. And um, the last thing I'll add is there's lots of talks about, you know, buzzwords, sustainable and transformative and regenerative. Um, you know, it's a whole other conversation that I take some issue with, but wh whomever you're traveling with or whatever you're doing, you should be contributing to that to conservation in that area, regardless of of whether or not it's including it in a tourist visa or you have to pay a day rate to be there. You should seek out what the conservation um, priorities are in Barcelona at the biosphere, and you should contribute to it because you are you know, it's not your right to be there. So two things on that, if I could, Shannon, um, the, some of those buzzwords that you referenced, um, you said you take issue with. Tell us a little bit about a little bit more about that. If you yes, would. You, yeah, of course. You look at mass market media, consumer driven media, travel trade media or LinkedIn. And it's all these people who are just debating the merits of using the word regenerative versus sustainable. I don't really don't care. What is it you're doing to, um, what are your goals and are you measuring your progress against those goals and are they tracking you towards enhanced sustainability, regeneration? I don't care what you call it. And I think what it does is it causes a lot of confusion in the marketplace when they say I would let the, the consumer, you know, research tells us, booking.com if it's to believe, um, Expedia research, that the consumer wishes to return to travel in a more conscious fashion. 
I'm going to believe the consumer's intention. At the same time, nobody's doing them any service by defining and redefining and telling you what it is and what it isn't and being critical of sort of one another's initiatives rather than trying to help the consumer determine what they should be looking for in a destination, when they should go, um, why they should avoid certain destinations in certain in in certain time periods, for example. So I think that it just muddies the it takes away from the sort of, I guess, clear action points and just goes into this nonsensical discussion because somebody wants their name on a on a definition. Yeah, I, can I so, take this? Thank you for that. Yeah. Absolutely, John, go ahead. I, yeah, I, I, I really appreciate what Shannon's saying because I, I, I get very frustrated, you know, especially where I'm at. Like every, you know, every five years, they're, they're kind of renaming it. And I, there's, there's nuances, but there's, yeah, I mean, it's, 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 I find it tiresome. So even when I'm, you know, I, I try to avoid, you know, spending a week on a definition, like what I'd say when I'm with, with students and uh, for the very reasons that, that, that Shannon mentioned. And, and, uh, um, you know, one of the, the, one of the big terms, it's experiential now as well. Um, and, uh, it, which I, you know, has a little bit, you know, the idea is that you're, you're providing sort of more meaningful experiences with local people and often engaging local people and by creating really meaningful deep experiences, then, then, then people may be, you know, may act upon or, or take some of that, the behavior that they might have been modeled or shown, you know, on this experience back home with them. But, but I, I do find the jargon around tourism um, very tiresome. And, and we, the companies that I work with have stayed away from eco -tour, the terms ecotourism, green tourism, sustainable tourism, and, and uh, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. And, you know. Any comments or observations, Dave, on the current current conversation? Yeah. Try to stay away from nope. tourists as best I can. Sorry. You said that out loud, Dave. Oh, yeah, sorry, sorry. What was? Yeah. I tried to stay away from tourists the best I can. <laughs> well, and and it's interesting. Interesting that you say that. Maybe interesting is the wrong word. Um, because I see a lot of what you do, Dave, because you do a great job of, of sharing it um, on your social media and, and obviously through the schools as well, which I wouldn't see. Um, and I look at what you're doing enviably. Um, and I think the biggest reason is because of the time, um, but also the the passion and the desire to get out there and really, you know, explore the world in a way that has a certain amount of risk involved, right? So I, I would put myself in the category of if I'm going to go travel somewhere, I want to do it with a certain level of comfort. And by comfort, I mean my definition of comfort. Um, you know, I've, I've, I've seen pictures of you with like, you know, ice and snow in your beard because you've just come off the water and it's whatever temperature. And I'm looking at that going, you know, how do you, how, what does that look like? And, and what supports do you have in place when you do something like that if it's, if it's not sort of driven primarily by um, tourism management or tourism industry. So what, I guess the question ultimately is, is what are your supports? What, what do you have in place when you do something like that? Well, I suppose, I suppose ultimately I am relying on those local more out there communities or people. And in a lot of circumstances, the relying almost on the generosity of strangers. So you could take cycle touring, for example. There's a lot of great places in Canada you can go on uh, some pretty long dirt roads in Canada. Let's just say that. There's a couple There's a couple really long ones in Quebec, and there's one really long one in the Yukon. Um, and uh, I've, I've been on the long ones in Quebec. Um, oftentimes, or in sea kayak, and really a lot of these human power type methods of transportation um, you're almost unwillingly before you start off, you're you're putting a lot of faith in the kindness of strangers um, uh, to help you out along the way, whether that might be a hot cup of coffee in the afternoon or or a place to set up a tent um, in the shade uh, or out of the rain. But um, sorry, sorry, did I? Oh, there no, we go. I, I, okay. I'm sorry. That's okay. That's all right. 
I, I think where I was going with the, the with the line of questioning, Dave, and and this is generally speaking to all of you, after you provided your definitions of sustainable tourism, or in your in your say, sense, Dave, you know, you start by saying human powered. So right away, you're you're you know talking about what what I would certainly come at this conversation with that understanding of what are the challenges that we have in managing tourism that in a sustainable way. So to your point, Shannon, when you, when you talk about it and you say, like, listen, tour, all tourism should be, should be sustainable. I mean, you know, and especially in the world that we find ourselves in now um, with climate control being at the forefront of everyone's mind and, and sustainability in general, regardless of what we're sustaining. So back to the question is what are the, what do each of you see as the challenges that we have facing us? And managing tourism in a sustainable way currently, and I'm I'm trying not to ask specifically about COVID and what the two years in COVID either did or didn't do for tourism in general and sustainable tourism. I was trying to avoid it, but I think it's really hard to have a conversation at all these days without asking about that angle. Go ahead. Okay. Well, maybe I'll um I'll get this. Yeah, that's that's a big question because uh, you know it's it's hard to ignore COVID. I mean, the company that I've been working with for 30 years, you know, uh, the, the, a brand new owner bought it, which and it's going back to an earlier point that Shannon was talking about in terms of, of ownership models and and she, you know, not owned internationally, and you know, the company I've been working for has gradually moved, you know. The ownership has gone from sort of a Vancouver-based family that had immigrated from Hungary, you know, there after the Russian invasion in the mid-50s. And the guy who started the company was an entrepreneur who loved to entertain and feed people. So, you know, it was these trips that were, you know, anyways, you know, around really providing this amazing wilderness, yet, you know, fully serviced experience. But and then you know, back in 2000, you know, the company was bought by Neil Hartling from Nohani River Adventures. Um, and then it was just recently bought by um, Joel Hubbard, whose family owned Nohani Wild out of, the, out of the Northwest Territories. And they're like a third generation family involved in tourism. And he bought it, you know, months before COVID hit. And um, and I, I had him actually zoom in and speak to my class a few times. And that's one of my students, you know, asked the question. Um, and, uh, and he said, you know, what's, what do you think is your biggest challenge? And, and he responded in a way that would be very different to any of the previous owners of that. And he said climate change, and he's working to try to make his company, a travel company of all things, carbon neutral by 2030. And, you know, and I, you know, so, and that's, you know, that, that's a significant challenge. And, uh, and, and so, uh, you know, and, and, and that's one of the ongoing challenges, especially especially with tourism, right? You know, because it's you know involves a lot of intensive travel, and and you know, and I I, I wrestle with that um, as well. Um, so I would think, uh, you know, because I'm flying away up to the Arctic, uh, you know, for 12 days along with 15 other guests, and and I remember I I had a, a professor once at the University of Alberta, and I and I was talking about this contradiction of tourism, ecotourism, sustainable tourism, values and ethics and challenges of tourism. And, and this wasn't a way that kind of made it easier for me, but he said, John, this is, that's a paper cut. And I said, well, what do you mean? He's, he's, uh, his name is Jim Butler. He said, John, it's a paper cut. And keep in mind, we're in Edmonton at the University of Alberta. And he said, you know, all of Northern Alberta has been leased, for, you know, for forestry agreements. And he said, if we can get people out there in the land, you know, and if we have some impact, he said, relative to the impacts of, of, you know, industry, oil and gas, he said, in my mind, that's a paper cutter for able to introduce people to these wild places and, 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 and inspire them, you know, and so that's, you know, I, I still wrestle with it, but that's, but that's always stuck with me. I, you know, Uno, I think this is going to be, I, I don't think there's a lot of challenges and I think, you know, and particularly, you know, I, you know, succeeding generations typically, you know, aspire for, for more, you know, more opportunities, more, more experiences. And, and as parents, we, you know, we hope that our children are successful. And, and that's been this model, you know, for multiple generations that I see is beginning to shift. Um, but when I look at tourism, the challenges, you know, outside of the COVID impacts and climate impacts, I think that um, we're running out of wild places. We're running out of these special places, going right back to the point that Shannon made about 
her experience in, in Iceland or what Dave mentioned. Um, uh, social media and the in the the invitation to these wild places. Um, uh, there's there's there aren't very many places that are untouched anymore that people don't have access to in one way or another. If you have wealth and and the level of a healthy disposable income, you can access most places and and most places internationally lack strong regulations. You know when I'm thinking about you know Machu Picchu for example, I've taken students there a couple times uh, for study trips and. And, um, you know, they, they've talked about, you know, we want to manage, you know, the Inca Trail. Um, we want to manage and minimize the impacts. But when then you think about the folks like, you know, the, um, that the porters on that trail who migrate from seasonally from farming and when the farming stops, then they go and they work as porters for probably likely very, very low wages. Um, you know, then they say, well, if we end up man managing this trail more then we're going to, you know, impact thousands and thousands of families across, you know, across, you know, this area. So um, anyways, the, the challenges are are quite huge. And I don't. I think our insatiable need to want and, and do more. I think it's going to be hard to to contain to contain a lot of these challenges unless we just have some very strict management. Anyways, that's 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 me for now. Re responses or reactions. First, Butler is in like the Butler life cycle that I've studied for some same Butler. Yeah, no, I mean, I know I know he's talking about the Charles Mary life cycle. And I'm talking about Jim Butler, um, but that was Richard Butler. But I know who you mean. Oh, yeah. yeah, but yeah, I, I'm yeah, I'm familiar with that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I would say tourism, the greatest risk to tourism, 100 percent is climate. And second is um, our perception of of what we're owed the royal you so i mean i spend my days i have a, i have a whole team member on staff to help us plot a, a core a course to net zero so zero emissions by 2050 which is what our our company goal is through you know organizations such as the science-based targets initiative so i have to lay out how to how to um how to draw down our footprint by 47.5% between now and 2030. I'm currently building a schedule on what investments we need to do, how, where the money is going to come from in order to do that, and then um, near 0% by 2450. It's a rigorous process um, and sort of the divestiture of carbon offsets and the move towards uh, reduction investments. So, yes climate and what I think people don't recognize about climate or they do but perhaps they're just not willing to uh, admit it is that more and more destinations if nothing is done are literally going to be go offline you can't go there for a variety of reasons primarily climate I mean we could we could go through the litany of sad stories I don't think that we need to I just think that 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 this will impact the average holiday goer um this year there's there's no question. So this isn't going away. So yeah, yes, hands down, climate, the shift of the renewables, the electrification is what keeps me awake at night. Um, and there's some really great destinations that are forward thinking, and then there's there's some really some really some really bad ones. Destinations will soon start to identify that tourism is a victim of our own success, and that's through marketeers, and that's through low cost airlines. Pretty much. I mean, I'll, I'll lay blame at their doorsteps, and that there's there's pretty much the the, the two reasons. Air law, air travel is going to change. It's going to get more expensive. I know people are moaning about it now. It's not going away. Sorry, guys. Um, and the sort of true cost of externalities, so the cost of the environment in air travel and every other service and good we provide, are going. They're going to have to become costed in. There's never. There's never been. Um, a line item on on a on a on a budget, not never. There are very few businesses that cost in the externalities of the environmental impact into their products and goods and services, and that's going to have to start happening. So destinations, one hopes, will start measuring in different ways. So currently, they measure in what we call packs. How many guests came to Machu Picchu this year? Great, we nailed it. Tell tell the minister we hit X amount of visitors. Um, 
that won't work anymore. You need to move to a model such as Bhutan, where you actually limit their numbers and you charge guests more. So I think that, you know, I think that the climate is 100%. At the same time, it's the visitor's belief that travel is a right. And unfortunately, it is it is not, and that is not meant to appear elitist. It is meant to recognize we haven't been paying enough. And that is that is just the reality of it. If you look at your sort of low, if you look at your all-inclusive, I got a great deal, yeah, but how much does the in individual who works there get paid? And you really have to dig behind the numbers there and think about it. And so um, we're going to start seeing models have to change. Governments are going to require more of their their sort of their inbound tourism network um, and the whole supply chain, it, 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 it comes up. So as you're saying that, and, and, and certainly it all makes sense to me, um, I go to a place of, so what about those of us who have this desire to travel um, and are going to be completely eliminated because of the rise in cost? For all of the reasons that you've just identified, Shannon, and, and uh, economically, it all makes sense. And, and, and that cyclical um, domino effect, rather, all makes sense. So if, if you're talking to somebody, and Dave, I'm coming at a question for you specifically because of your time spent primarily in the Atlantic Canada region um, and in, in, in Labrador, for example. So if we're talking to people who need to stay, stay closer to home uh, because of travel costs, um, you know, what is Atlantic Canada or, or whatever sort of geographical area that you want to kind of take into consideration with this question? What is Atlantic Canada in, in need of in terms of addressing sustainable tourism? Do you have any, any high points or any sort of um, perspectives on that so that we can create more tourism in our own backyard and do it in a sustainable way and, and, and a responsible way? I can talk specifically for Nova Scotia pretty well. Um, probably Newfoundland, New Brunswick, the rest of Atlantic Canada is probably very similar. Um, we have a lot of great opportunities here, and, and, and they're being showcased like through through the media and and you know the advertisement, and marketing, and whatnot. Um, some great opportunities, and but there's and to really protect those really wild areas, but still. The, it's like, how do you say? It's like the the fishermen are the greatest conservationists because the fishermen, the fisher person, excuse me, doesn't want to take out all the fish in the rivers and the lakes because then they don't have any fish to catch. So they're the ones who are the strongest proponents for the wellness of fish, for example. Um, tourists, I mean, people who are into backcountry type trips. Um, you know, we have the popular places. We have the national parks. We have Kejimakujik. We have Fundy. We have, you know, Cape Breton Highlands National Park. Um, there's a lot of great places to go. And they're permitted. So there's, there's a certain number of people who are allowed to go to certain areas at certain times. And it's all very well tracked. But uh, there's also a lot of other places that are that have small organizations, um, of mostly volunteer organizations. Um, that put together maps and there is infrastructure that exists to explore more of our wilderness areas uh far less infrastructure but there are a lot of like small grassroots organizations that are working really hard same as the fisher people to protect we, we need that balance of people going into these places and maintaining the trails uh and not too many people um to overuse them Um, and I, I haven't, haven't done this yet in the session. Sorry, folks. So everyone who's online and listening, now is your ta your opportunity to toss a question into the chat function. If you if you've been thinking about something that you want to pose to the to the guests, and I haven't stopped asking questions long enough to allow you to do that. So please consider doing that in the next couple of minutes. Um, my next question to all of you, and I'll ask it. I don't know what other way to ask it other than to sound like I might sound like I'm trying to stir it up a little bit, but. I've heard a little bit about, um, you know, tourism industry attracting people 
um, to the area and doing it in a way that is educational around how to sustain it and how to conserve it and to do all the right things like buying local and, and spending your money locally versus um, sort of the, the other options available. But I've also heard language around the tourists themselves being responsible for seeking out what the conservation looks like in an area that they're traveling and seeking out local industry. Whose responsibility is it? And you don't get to get away by saying both. <laughs> or, or I guess maybe you do. But ultimately, is, is, is it uh, if I'm you know, providing the industry, um, is it my job to make sure that I'm doing everything I can to encourage those that are taking in that industry to do it in, in a responsible way? Or as a tourist, should I be doing all that before I head out? And is that then going to sort of lend itself to people saying, well, to pot with that, I'm not doing all that work. I just want to show up and, and have fun. Yeah, I'll jump in. Um, first off, I didn't mean to imply that tourism was going to be was was tomorrow going to become prohibitively expensive for average bear. I do think the pendulum. I don't think I think as humans we're unable to find middle ground. Sadly, so the pendulum will swing and it'll come back, but we'll adapt. I mean, the hyper local market is exactly what recovered first after COVID, and it will continue to stay strong because some people are just not going to get on flights, and that's that's fine. Um, but when it comes to the responsibility, it is it is both 100 percent because it depends on how you're traveling. If you're traveling on a group tour, if you're traveling with a, a travel agent who's organizing it for you, if you're you know traveling with a small group experiences, then it is the travel provider's responsibility. But if you're doing sort of FIT, fully independent travel, and you're just showing up into Spain, then then. Yeah, I am the family holiday planner um, and everyone thinks it's fun and it it sometimes is fun, but it's also a hell of a lot of work. Um, and that's just that's just the nature of it. I think that that's just the I think that's part of the fun, frankly. I mean, I, I say I say that with sometimes it's fun, sometimes it's not it depends on who's kicking at my heels. But but, you know, it's it's a great way to learn. It's a great way to understand what it is you're going where you're where you're who you're doing it with and yeah so it's depends on the, the form of travel you're taking yeah you know i was i was gonna say yeah I, I absolutely it's it's it it's both right i mean i know you said you know pick one or the other but it, it absolutely is i mean as you know i i have a responsibility when i'm when i'm I'm, you know, there's the company the own that has the responsibility how they work sort of at the corporate level when i'm actually on the ground guiding you know in these remote areas you know i have a responsibility how you know how we act you know day to day you know and dave and i've guided together and and you know in terms of how we manage our experience our impacts you know you know kind of on the ground at hand but also you know the messaging that that you know that the court the company might want to provide to its clients but also the responsibility that that you know when i you know that companies have beyond you know, the experience in their their clients, but how they involve themselves in the actually the profession and the industry. And so there's some really good organizations. You know, we've got the Tourism Industry Association. Every province has one. And then there's, you know, the, the, all sorts of, you know, in, Ecotourism International, et cetera. And I think participation in those organizations is is good because I think it um, it's opportunities for for others to to engage and learn and to, you know, understand, you know, what are different standards. But I just want to just quickly finish off by saying that, you know, being a tourist, no matter how you label yourself, sustainable tourism, ecotourism, whatever, it's, you know, you know, everyone that's on this call, for example, you know, I would say has responsibility when they travel. So you don't have to be booking a trip with with Shannon or 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 stuff that I do up in the Yukon or, you know, it's it's, you know, it really is, you know, also some real personal responsibility uh, as well. And and Paying money to be a client, you know, doesn't change whether or not you should consider considering your impacts on the environment, right? It, you know, you can, when I talk to my students, I say, when you put your backpack and going, and you're going in Keji, you know, you think about it then, you think about it when you take a bus tour, you think about it when you go on a bike tour, it's, it doesn't, it's not an ethic that changes depending on whether you're doing it independently or you're hiring someone to show you around. There's also Absolutely. The of the consumer to push those who are not on yeah. board to get on board. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and you're absolutely right. And, and John, when you, you know, when you're speaking, I, I remember one of the 
key pieces that I took away from my outdoor rec degree all those years ago. And it was that, that, that saying of take only pictures, leave only footprints. You know, we were talking about that decades and decades ago, and, and it still stands today. And I, it, you know, your, your point about regardless of what you're doing in, in terms of tourism and, and what, how you label yourself as a tourist and, and Dave, you know, sort of depending on where you go and what it looks like. I mean, I can get up this weekend and, and hop in my vehicle and drive to another town in Nova Scotia. And when I get there, I can choose to buy local. I can choose to go get my coffee at a local coffee shop versus going through the drive through at Tim's and leaving my vehicle running while I'm there. You know, so, so these choices and these options face us every single day um, when we're spending money in an economy, whether or not it's our local economy or our provincial economy or a little bit broader or, or further. Um, so, so remembering those things and, and the reason I sort of bring it back to that is because I mentioned to each of you when we were chatting about this topic that what I like to do is, is challenge folks who are on the line, um, you know, to think about where they are currently, what their current practices are, but most importantly, you know, some sort of call to action. Um, and, and I think, you know, COVID the last couple of years saw people having to stay home um, and people starting to explore their, black, their backyard who have never spent a summer in Nova Scotia before. Um, and they're starting to say, whoa, there's some really cool places in Nova Scotia. And it's like, well, ta-da. You know, so so anyone who's thinking about making that trek anywhere, it doesn't have to be a deep woods back trek like Dave does. It doesn't need to be well overseas like both, you know, John and Shannon have talked about. It's that sort of that behavior that we're hoping that folks are really starting to think about. Um, you know, and I think about the the old adage that we haven't bored the earth from our grandparents, from our grand, our grandchildren. What is it? We haven't inherited the earth from our grandparents. We've boarded it from our grandchildren, right? Um, so, so a, a send off point from each of you. Anything that you'd like to to share as we sign off? I've been keeping an, uh, an eye in the chat. I haven't seen any questions, um, folks on the line. If you do think about something afterwards that you'd like to to pose to either of the speakers or to connect with them, please let me know and I'll do my best to connect you with, with the panelists uh, post event if you have that interest. So I'll pause for a moment before I let you know who the winner of the swag package is um, that we'll send out to you uh, to see if, if, if either of you, John, Dave, or Shannon have some send off comments or, or words of inspiration for us. I'll, I'll just jump in there right away and just uh, adventure is a state of mind. If, Whatever that means to you, you can be walking out your door and walking your dog down to the beach, right? So, it never you never want to compare yourself to other people. It's, it's just all on yourself. So, adventure, state of mind, whatever you want to do, go do that. Um, but everyone in this call, we we are the converted. We know we know all this, right? We're hope I would assume all of us are the converted. We we know that if we're going to be tourists, we're gonna if I'm going to drive down to Lunenburg, I'm going to shop local, and we're going to do that. But just because like we're the, we're the knowledge keepers. These conversations are are that much more important to continue having, but also not just the conversations, but by showing through our actions as well. So, and uh, I, I never chipped in on that last sentence, but we all all the locals, all of ourselves through our actions, we can show all the people around us um, and how important um, it really is. Shannon or John, thank you. Yeah, sure. I think that um, you know your travel your travel matters. If you're 50 kilometers away from home, if you're 5,000 kilometers away from home, make it matter. And it is the is the greatest education I maintain that we can give our kids. Um, if we if we could send, I mean, I wager that if we could send half of America to one country in the Middle East just once, they'd all come back and say, oh, we really had it wrong. We had it wrong. And that's true on a number of, uh, of, of fronts, I think. So, you know, we want to pursue travel. It matters matters to us as individuals, but it also must matter to the destination who's reliant on those on those tourism dollars and the infrastructure that, that you bring in and the fact that you, um, you know, must always remember you're a guest in their home. And, and I think that, that that's really important. Yeah, thanks, Shannon. I also just, I mean, I just want to thank everyone for coming too. I see some familiar, familiar names there, and uh, it's, yeah, and I just, you know, I mean, I, I would, I would certainly agree with Dave and, and Shannon. I don't have a lot to to add to that, other than that, you know, 
tourism travel is also about relationship building, which we know like we didn't talk a lot. And there's a lot of inequity within the relationships, which we could explore at, at, at another time. Um, but it's it's very much about relationship building, you know, and that is, you know, with the people you're traveling with, with the with with the uh, with the the places and, and the experiences you're going, and um, and you know, and I we often I talk, you know, is tourism a good thing or a bad thing? We just have these great sort of debates, and uh, but ultimately, you know, we come back to, you know, we've got these challenges that we're all working so hard at. Shannon's, you know, doing it at the industry level, and Dave's doing it through his education. And I guess I'm doing it through the stuff that I do, um, but but we don't want to become so you know frustrated and or disillusioned that we don't understand the power of it too, you know, to promote peace. Quite honestly, I know that sounds cheesy and uh, relationships, and I you know, so I just want to kind of leave us with that with that optimistic um, you know, way of thinking about it as well. So thanks for joining us. Thank you for that, John. And I don't think it sounds cheesy at all. Um, and and I think, uh, Dave, I, I think it was you who said, like, I'm pretty sure everyone who's on the line this evening probably is already at a, a very similar starting point in terms of understanding and, and actions and responsibility and feeling that cheesiness that you've referenced. So back to the comment that you made, Shannon, that, you know, each and every one of us has an individual responsibility to encourage that same consumer behavior in other people. Uh, and that's and that's the way it's going to it's going to sort of trickle out into the rest of the community and the rest of the world. So thank you to each of you very much for being here, for bringing your perspectives, for bringing your experiences. Um, you know, I'm sitting here and it is a challenge when we say that we're going to do this for an hour. We are a little bit past the hour. I think it's the first time in doing one of these virtual events that we've gone past the eight o'clock hour. Um, but it's tough because there's there's topics in there that I wanted to sort of toss out into the conversation, but I realized it was going to go into yet another angle of conversation. So I feel like this one could easily be a part A and a part B or maybe even a part C. So everyone on the line, thank you very much for your time this evening and joining us. Um, appreciate that you are here with our panel, our panel of speakers. Uh, and the winner, through a complete random draw done by our back Back uh, orchestrator Charlie is Diana Barba, and I believe you may even win the distance award too, based on some of the countries or some of the uh, geographical representations that Charlie said were on the line this evening. So we'll get in touch with you and and uh, find out how we can get your draw prize out to you. Um, I believe, if I remember, and if I've got the right person, that you were dialing in from Mexico. So thank you for joining us. Um, and uh, like I said, folks, the the place there she is. Are you, in fact, have you joined us from Mexico, Diana? Yeah, yes, yes, I'm, I'm in Mexico right now. <laughs> so thank you for this, this that's, time. That's, you're welcome. We'll send it to you and we'll be in touch for sure. Uh, and as I said, everyone, the recording uh, will be posted probably within a week or so. So please feel free to share with folks. And, and once again, folks on the line, if you have questions and you would like them uh, sent along to our panel speakers, I can make, make arrangements to have that happen as well. So thank you again and good evening. Thanks.